Thank you, Minister, uh, for those insights and very thoughtful contribution, if I may say so. Now, the plan is this. Whatever happens, we won't let you out until you've had a, a chance to look at all the projects and quiz us and so on. But before we do that, Tim O'Shea, who is the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh and Chair of the TEL Steering Committee, is going to do a short... <laughs> do I make myself clear? Yeah. A short response. Uh, depends how short you are. If, a couple of questions if, there, if there's time. Very good. So I really want to start by thanking David uh, for his presentation. I think in the United Kingdom we are tremendously blessed to have a Minister of State for Universities and Science uh, with such a deep uh, personal understanding of the social sciences and such an enthusiasm uh, for the technology, and it's a real plus. Um, as, as Richard said, I'm the chair of the stakeholder panel for the TEL projects. I'm also chair of the JISC, uh, and from both vantage points, I'm, I'm immensely proud of what has been done there. Um, a, f a few reactions and comments of David's excellent speech. Um, David said that his colleague Michael Gove says that iPods and personal devices uh, can be disruptive in a classroom. He's right, and it's jolly good, and that's what we want. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one view of the Tell 8 projects is that all eight are very disruptive, very different, and very ambitious, and very successful technology-enhanced learning projects. Because we do want to disrupt the current classroom in different ways, and we do want to enhance it. Uh, something which I think is very important for me to underline, Minister, is that uh, the TEL comes from a very successful collaboration between ESRC and EPSRC. Represents real value for money. It is quite an unusual thing, because if you imagine the TEL stakeholder panel, quite routinely the person from the ESRC says, well, that sounds all like technology to me, or the person from EPSRC says, ooh, what's that got to do with boxes and wires? Uh, but, and there have been other attempts uh, by these two research councils and their predecessors to collaborate. Um, in my experience, and I've been a researcher in this area for a long time before I got turned by a bad fairy into a manager, um, they, this, is the, this is by far the most successful collaboration they have had. Um, in terms of resolving the technology push and the education pull, these tensions have been resolved, uh, resolved in many important ways uh, for using uh, technology to enhance learning. And I thought... Uh, that the agenda that you put forward, uh, I was particularly pleased as somebody who spent uh, 19 years of my career working for the Open University to hear you talk about prison education, uh, to hear you talk about learners with difficulties, to hear you talk about uh, vocational and technical education. And, I, and you're absolutely right. These technologies have a particular role there. But I would say from my own experience, particularly of using um, uh, technology for learners with difficulties, it's, that is a wonderful research methodology also, because if you get the package to work for the partially sighted or the blind student, or get the package to work for the student who is imprisoned for some reason, you have also enhanced the package for all the other learners too. So it makes a very good, so it's actually a very good way. It's good because it's, it's reaching a particular audience that needs reach, but it's also good because it's a forcing uh, function. A question for us has to be, will the rate of change with respect to technology-enhanced learning slow down? And the answer I give you very clearly is no. It's very clearly no because there is an important law that's true and there's another law that's very important that's false. Moore's law remains true. Uh, Moore, who obviously was responsible for a semiconductor uh, for the computer on the trip, he predicted that the power, whether you measure it by uh, memory or by processor speed, uh, of a, a technology would imp improve do about double every 18 months. It was surprising at the time. It's surprising now, but modern physics tells us, um, I'm very proud to be the from the university that's got Peter Higgs, but modern physics tells us that this is going to go on for at least another six to eight years. So that technology push for Morse law, and what has that done? Well, one of the things, and we see it in all the eight tail projects, is it breaks the constraints of space and time. You suddenly get devices that are powerful enough that students can operate at different times, at different places. And that depends on Moore's law. And the wonderful thing is Moore's law will stay true. Metcalf, Metcalf's law is less well known. Metcalf was uh, responsible for packet switching. It's the reason the internet works. 
uh, Metcalf and Sproul, and it's also the reason the Ethernet worked. And Metcalf predicted that with the increase in traffic on the Internet, it would fall down around about 2000. And he actually promised to eat his hat in front of the ACM Computer Communications Conference if it was still going um, in the, the following decade. And he had to eat his hat. He's a very honourable man, he did. Um, but, and Metcalfe's law being false, and obviously being false, re re reaches out to a point that Richard made and that you subsequently made. Uh, internet bandwidths and web access is increasing. And that means that as well as breaking the bounds of space and time, we're also suddenly breaking scalability. So these early MOOCs now, which have reached audiences of in excess of 100,000, uh, the, the, the most famous Stanford one reaching an audience of 160,000, they are not a surprise. Um, they are, and that can be achieved and overachieved. So <clears throat> I'm very pleased that you're excited about MOOCs. As you say, Ed Edinburgh is doing uh, six MOOCs. Um, and we have, we have not publicised them, and we really have 89,000 people who have signed up. God knows what happens. No advertising. Yeah. No. Yeah. no, we haven't. No, we're just quietly doing it. I mean, you'll find it on the website as a work in progress. Uh, but we're very excited about that. And I think your point about um, using online for overseas learning, uh, for us as an insurance policy, if you like, against the UK Borders Agency, but not that that's necessary. <laughs> well, it, 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 every, every school of the University of Edinburgh has been instructed and financed to have one non-trivial, and by non-trivial I mean more than 100 learners, uh, learning online remotely on a major postgraduate course, every single of our 22 schools. And I think that is a vision, the vision that Edinburgh um, has for MOOCs and for distance education, um, on, overseas mm. could, could be extended and I think with your great interest and I was delighted that following your visit to California you've got the Goldman Sachs event where you will be uh, trying to in, indoctrinate all my peer vice chancellors I think uh, that, that is an extremely good thing to do and then we have the question and it's very much like Richard's question which I thought was very cute is, you know, do iPads enhance learning yeah. how can MOOCs work successfully to enhance learning well, they won't, in, they won't do it just like that. And Martin, being the vice chancellor of the Open University, I'm sure he wasn't talking about Edinburgh, saying some of the universities galloping in are being reckless. Is, is, is probably, is, I mean, they're not going to provide high quality learning uh, for 2000 uh, just like that. And it's, to me, it seems obvious that if we want to use MOOCs for the great goal, you said, for widening access, then exactly the research methodology that has underpinned the 8TEL tell project, that is what you need to do. So some part of government, whether it's TSB or the research councils or uh, the GISC, which I chair, some part of government needs to find some resource. You can't just do MOOCs. You've got to understand... Uh, I mean, the, the technology is there. The technology is even, you know, there's half a dozen uh, platforms for MOOCs that are available. But in terms of the, the tell context, the learner, the learning environment, the teacher, the, the larger social environment, those have got to be done. So um, the minister gave us a great speech. We're really lucky to have an enthusiast uh, for technology with a deep understanding of social sciences in this role. So please join me in applauding David again. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I, I don't often dare to disagree with Tim, but just regarding Metcalfe's law, he clearly didn't know about Virgin Media. <laughs> um, mine, fell, mine fell over long before 2000. Um, now, the Minister has kindly agreed to answer a couple of questions. Uh, we're more or less on target for time. Uh, anybody like to, to comment or ask a question? Yes. Uh, we've got a roving mic. Just hang on one sec. Just a question about TEL in general. It seems to me that um, it's most successful in abdication as against in the sense of the Latin that aduco means to lead out, whereas aduco would be to lead to. And so most of the projects that seem to be the successful ones are the ones that enhance skill sets and lead to something. I just wondered whether that was a generality that uh, you accept or reject. Mm. That's, uh, that's very interesting. I, I think that, well, the truth is that there are several different business models, if I may call them that, being developed. 
and there's a, the, it's suddenly become a very hot subject in California, but equally we, should, we can be proud of our British experience. And they, they vary from some people who believe you can do a complete program of learning online, for example. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that many would see uh, programs like Coursera as ultimately recruitment devices. Uh, and the, there's quite a high rate uh, of attrition in which people who start the course don't complete. But some of the people who do complete the course are then seen as, as targets then to do another, another year or two years at Stanford or wherever. Uh, so you may, you may well be right that it's hard to do the, the complete program purely online, but, but we will see. And, I'm, and, I, and I think what's very important is in Britain, with our strengths, and if you look at the presence on iTunes U, if you look at the role of the Open University in distance learning, you look at the University of London and its external degrees, the strength of universities like Edinburgh, uh, we should be able to try out several models and see which ones thrive. And if I can just add a comment, if you look at um, like the search technology MOOC, mm. you can say 160,000 students took it, only 8,000 completed. Gosh, you know, 5% completion, that's terrible. Alternatively, you could say, which university, other university in the world can teach 8,000 people about search technology at the same time? That, that's a large number. And the other thing we're seeing is a lot of the people who go into the MOOCs go into it for, a, they don't want the award, they don't want to complete, they're a bit interested and they then usefully mm. go on to something else. It is quite a different model. Mm. Let's have one more. Uh, it doesn't have to be related to MOOCs. <laughs> <laughs> Even if the minister would like it to be. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's very hard to see. I've got the lights in my eyes, so make a big fuss if you've got your hand up. So I, in the absence of questions, I will ask the minister a very cheeky question. What hope have we got for social science funding related to education and technology funding coming together again in the same wonderful way that they did for the TEL project? Ah. <laughs> not, I wish we'd had a question from the floor. Uh, well, I think that there are... Uh, it's a very fair question. As you know, the, the, the TEL project and that particular funding, you know, we've had had those eight... Those eight examples. Um, I think there are two possible. One is you can, of course, have um, application. You can still apply to the EPSRC in responsive mode funding for funding for programs uh, for technology-enhanced learning. And secondly, I can't commit on this, but there may be ways in which through the TSB, especially as we're now thinking about education as a business sector, now, it is not only, I have to, again, terrible difficulty if I'm not very careful. There is more to education than business. And I'm not saying that you've all become educationists because you wanted to, to uh, be business people. I fully understand that education cannot be reduced simply to a business activity. Nevertheless, there is this enormous expanding international market. You do need some private capital to help fund it. It does need to be managed. So it can be business-like, and certainly when it comes to export testimony. Now, at that point, we may be able to see if there are TSB programs linked to uh, uh, e-infrastructure uh, that could be used to help deliver some of these technologies in the future as well. So I think those are, there are two candidates. Okay. And, so, and so we should address the technology strategy board in some way as a community. Well, we are. Uh, well, let, let me give you a, let, let me give you some uh, some slightly different advice. We have we launched the industrial strategy with Vince's speech in September, and we have identified in that as one of the sectors that is crucial. We have identified education as a sector, as a business sector. As I say, let me repeat, we're not trying to convert every existing university of school into a business, but nevertheless, when you look at, when the Indonesians come and say, we want to educate another quarter million students extra year after year, it's very hard to see how a completely conventional model of a charitable status English HEI is going to be able to rise to that kind of challenge. You need alternative models. So now... We have the challenge, I'm the minister responsible for doing this challenge. I, the, my challenge is to deliver 
the education part of industrial strategy over the next six or nine months so that we have a set of proposals of how we could deliver that. And that will be led by a, a team of officials in biz. If you know, we have some experts here, Tim, Richard, whatever, if people want to come together and, s and send in some ideas as to how we can harness technology as part of that education strategy, you can feed it in to that exercise. And um, I can't guarantee the outcome, and I can't guarantee funding, but that is a vehicle that you should use to mm -hmm. pursue this um, very important aspect of learning. Thank you very much, Minister. I th that is too optimistic a note not to stop. <laughs> it, it can only go downhill from there. Um, so thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we're going to have a little time now to look at the exhibition again. And at half past five is the world premiere of the Tell video that is literally, I think, was completed at 10 o'clock this morning. It's only 15 minutes long, and then we'll go straight into the panel, which I know m many of you are looking forward to, like I am. So thank, once again, thank you very much indeed for your <coughs> visit, Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.